I just recently finished upgrading our inverter from the Go Power that we had for almost four years now to the Victron Multi Plus 2, which is a brand new inverter. Spoiler alert, it's incredible. I am super excited to share this with you guys. You probably haven't seen this much excitement in me since we had our internet video. You know I'm a geek and I love tech. Along those lines though, because this is such a complicated video and it involves AC power and DC power and all that good stuff, if you're not comfortable with that stuff, by all means get a professional to help you. Like usual with these kind of things for us, this is not a how-to video. We're not gonna show you every step. This is a how we did it video and I wanna cover our install, but I'm gonna do that briefly so that I have time to show you all the cool stuff and do some demos. Also, this is not sponsored in any way by any company. We purchased our inverter and of course batteries and all this stuff uh, from various companies. We do have affiliate relationships with a lot of them, so we'll have links below. But I do wanna give a shout out to Jared from All About RVs. He got a hold of this inverter a lot sooner than I did and had a video out on it a few months ago. I reached out and bounced a few ideas and questions off of him and he was super helpful. If you haven't seen his channel, be sure to go check that out. I'll have a link below. The model that we're talking about here is the 12 volt, three kilovolt amps, 2X120. I'll break that down for you. What that means is it's a 12 volt model, not 24, 48, anything like that. It's also three kilovolt amps. Victron rates their inverters in kilovolt amps, which which is quite honestly a little bit more honest. I think a lot of companies use that same number or they use watts when they really mean kilovolt amps. I'll get into that a little bit more later, but I'm not gonna go way into the weeds on that. And the last is one of the most important parts, the 2X120. This inverter is a full 50 amp pass through. It has 220 volt lines in, 220 volt lines out. So first off, why on earth are we swapping a 3000 watt or kilovolt amp a 3000 watt inverter for another 3000 watt inverter. Why would we do that? Well, a couple of reasons. First off, when we did the Go Power four years ago, it was really the only inverter of that size that I found that did full 50 amp pass through. If you don't know what that means, I'll put our wiring diagram on the screen here, but basically that means I don't have to have any sub panels or any kind of crazy weird wiring or break out some circuits and power some things and not other things. It goes straight from the ATS, the automatic transfer switch, straight into the inverter and then straight into the distribution panel. So everything in the RV is powered by the Go Power when we had it and of course this new one. Victron just came out with this. Prior to this, they did not have a model that had full 50 amp pass through. And it's not just that, Victron has a couple of legs up on Go Power. First off, some of my gripes with the Go Power. The interface wasn't great. It was kind of hard to tell what was going on on the screen that used to be here. There was no logging ability, no ability to control it remotely, no way to see its interaction with other items like our solar charge controllers or our shunt. Also, the Go Power had no way to upgrade the firmware. So as they make improvements to the models and to the firmware, both on the display and the inverter itself, the only way to get those updates was to send it back, have them send you a new one, do work out some kind of swap, and that's obviously a huge pain, particularly on the inverter itself. Additionally, the Go Power had a little bit of trouble interacting with our generator. The generator sometimes, you know, the power can fluctuate up and down, it gets little spots in the gas or whatever, has a little bit of hiccup. The Go Power would just take over and it would do so at the most inopportune time when three ACs are running and it would just shut everything down. So let's chat about the Victron and why I got it to fix some of these issues. Number one, firmware updates galore all over the air. You just click download, install, and it's done. This is all done through the Victron Connect app, which is another benefit. The Victron Connect app can see the MultiPlus, the solar charge controllers, the shunt, and when we get to the Serbo GX, it's gonna bring all that together in a really, really cool interface where I can see everything at once. It also interacts with the other Victron components that I have. I mentioned the solar controllers, which you saw in the solar video. Hopefully, if you didn't, I'll link it below. Also the smart shunt. All the Victron components can work together in what's called a VE smart network so that the inverter can know about the battery levels through the shunt. They can both know about the solar charge controllers and they can all work together. Another big, big difference, and this one is huge, 
This is one of the biggest improvements that I was hoping for, and that's PowerShare. So PowerShare is when you're connected to something like 30 amp or generator, and you wanna run just a little bit more than what's available via 30 amp or generator or whatever, PowerShare comes into play. Now both of these inverters do PowerShare, and both of them only monitor line one. However, the Go Power, it's just all line one all day. Coming out of the Go Power, it separates both lines, and even when you're inverting or connected to something like 30 amp, where the two lines are bridged anyway, it's still only monitoring line one. And that presents a real problem trying to manage your power and figure out which line things are running on. Now the Victron, it bridges line one and line two. When it detects a connection like 30 amp or generator where the phases are in phase from both lines, it bridges those and just jumpers them together and considers them one line. So now with the Victron, I can run PowerShare for the whole RV. I can just connect the 30 amp run other stuff above 30 amp and the Victron handles it regardless of which line it's on and we're going to demo that at the end it's really cool i will also say though that go powers customer service has been top notch i can email them i can get an email back in the same day Victron is a little different it's a ginormous company i think it's in the netherlands or switzerland or somewhere i don't know there is no direct customer support through Victron. you have to go through your dealer or whomever you bought your inverter from for us, that's Battleborn. Luckily, Battleborn does have great customer service, and I've been able to email them and bounce ideas off them and, uh, and get this all going, because the Victron stuff can be a bit confusing, and I'm gonna get into that also. So let's chat a little bit about the install. As I mentioned, I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of detail here, because every install is different anyway, and we were also moving from one inverter to another, but I do want to talk about a few tips that I found along the way and cover just a few points. First is the location of the inverter. If you noticed in our solar video, we moved the Go Power inverter from the top of the generator box up to the ceiling, for lack of a better term. It's you know the, the upside in the uh, front bay there. And that got it out of the way, but there were a couple of problems with that. One, it was mounted right to the frame, right under our bed. So any vibrations from the fans running or anything like that were transmitted directly into the frame and seemed to resonate around our heads. So that turned out to be a problem. Also, the Victron inverter does not lend itself to that type of mount. You can't really mount it up on a ceiling like that. It's designed to be mounted flat or on its side on a wall kind of thing. But since this inverter has a bit of a different shape to it, it's a little bit thinner, it's only about five inches deep, uh, I was able to mount it on the side of our generator box. All I had to really do to prep that area was move my generator starter cables because they came right out the side. I had to move those to the back and then I put a nice thick half inch piece of plywood to mount the inverter to as well as the Servo GX. Another quick note on the install of the Victron uh, versus the Go Power and even previous Victrons. The new Victron Multi Plus 2 has like push in connectors for the AC wiring, which is basically you just push it in and it locks and to get it out, you have to push a pin and release it. Sounds great in theory. The trouble is AC wiring, particularly the, the 6.3 Romex, the six gauge that you have to use if you wanna do full 50 amp wiring like this is really stiff and thick and hard to bend. And it makes it a little bit more difficult because all four of your connections are all right next to each other. And when you've got four stiff wires right next to each other, it's easiest to try to insert them all at once. And that is difficult. I got lucky and got the AC in to work, but the AC out, I just tried and tried and tried for hours. I ended up having to separate out my four lines in my 6.3 Romex a little bit further down so that I can bend and manipulate them individually. I also wanna chat a little bit about the DC wiring. Now the DC wiring isn't any more complex than it was for either inverter. For this type of inverter, you generally wanna have four out wiring, so it is a thick cable, but you can get welding cable and it's, it's much more pliable even than the 6.3 Romex. The issue I ran into though was the cables that I made. In our previous inverter installation, I had tested running the ACs and things like that, but we didn't have the battery power until we did our solar project to really load test it for more than just a few minutes. Once I did that though, the wiring got hot. We're talking 190, 200 degrees Fahrenheit hot. It uh, blew the fuse, it was not good. And I don't know if that defect in my wiring was there all along, 
or if perhaps I did it when I moved everything for the solar because I have a 180 degree bend from the fuse to this cutoff switch. And that's where the problem was. And when I did the solar, I had to move them closer together, which closed that C a little bit. Maybe it caused some breaks in the strands or something. I can't tell exactly what it was, but this got me thinking about a viewer recommendation for batterycablesusa.com. Ordering in this way, you have to know your lengths and your sizes, but you can specify the size of cable you want, the color of the cable, what kind of lugs you want on each end, or maybe no lug on one end. And that turned out to be a really good investment. And I think if I were to redo this whole project, I would probably just get all my measurements and order my cables from them. But with these new cables from Battery Cables USA, all my temps are nice and low. I mean, they're getting warm. It's, you know, 250 amps pumping through there but they're all staying around 100, 110 degrees Fahrenheit, so I'm good with that. That's all I really have for install tips on this. Most of it was pretty straightforward. A lot of it was already in place, you know, swapping one inverter for another, but I do want to take you on a tour now and just show you that front bay and all the stuff and how it's connected. I want to give you guys a quick tour of the power setup, both DC and AC side of our entire system here. So first off on the DC side, everything goes through the bus bars. You've got a positive bus bar here, negative bus bar here, uh, rated at 600 amps, plenty of uh, capacity through that bus system. And everything feeds off that bus or feeds into that bus, depending on, of course, charging or discharging. So let's start with the solar. You'll see that I've got a couple of lines coming in here. These are our PV lines or photovoltaic lines coming straight from our solar panels. Those go through this breaker and then feed these two solar controllers. These two solar controllers basically control everything down to 12 volts and whatever amperage we can get out of that, depending on the sunlight. That 12 volt supply goes through this set of breakers and straight to the bus bar. You can see the negatives coming straight down and then the positives go through here to the bus bar. So that is the solar side, and of course it's supply only. Now let's take a look at the battery section. 10 100 amp hour battle borns are also connected directly to the bus system. Positive side goes through a switch, so that's a master cutoff. And the negative side goes through this smart shunt. This is what gives the Victron system the ability to monitor all power going into and out of the batteries. Nothing touches the batteries that doesn't go through that shunt. The negative side, this connection here, comes right down and goes straight up to the batteries. So nothing gets through the batteries without going through the shunt, and that's the whole idea. So that's how the batteries are charged and discharged through that system. Whenever the DC system needs more juice or is getting more juice, it all goes through there. Now the inverter DC side, you'll see we've got coming off the positive through a 400 amp class T fuse through the switch and then goes straight down to the inverter. Uh, the negative side of the inverter just connects right up there. And that's all we have for connection to this guy. And of course, this guy is the inverter. And it can either supply charge to the batteries or use charge when inverting or in power share mode. Now the AC side, the alternating current 120 volt side is super simple. We've got a 6.3 Romex, which is six gauge three wires, meaning it's got hot one, hot two, neutral and ground. Yes, I know it's four wires, but it's called 6.3. I guess the ground doesn't really count. That comes through straight from the ATS or automatic transfer switch. So the ATS will have power either from shore power or from the generator. And then that comes in and goes straight in to the inverter. And then coming out of the inverter, goes straight back up and right to the distribution panel. So everything AC powered goes through here, just like with the go power. And that way it can supply power in power share mode or inverter mode straight out and power the entire RV. So now let's jump into some of the really cool stuff that makes the Victron gear uh, so appealing. One is the configuration and management of their products. They've got an app called Victron Connect and most of their newer products like our charge controllers and our smart shunt have Bluetooth built in. The Multi Plus 2 that I installed has a Bluetooth dongle that you can install and then you can connect to that via Bluetooth also. So unlike the Go Power, where I could only configure things through the screen and if there were any updates to that system, I had to get a whole new screen or a whole new inverter. 
The Victron stuff, you manage everything through the Victron Connect app, through Bluetooth. It's super, super convenient, super easy. The Multi Plus 2 is a little bit different for some reason in what you can do over Bluetooth. So when you connect the Bluetooth dongle, it recognizes it. You see it in the Connect app. You can see all kinds of data. You can see the power in, the power out. You can change things like your amperage threshold. You can turn it off, you can turn it on, you can put it in inverter mode, but you can't configure it, which is a bit of a bummer. I'm not sure if they'll improve that in the future or not, but to configure the Multi Plus 2, you need a thing called an MK3 to USB dongle. And what that does is it lets you connect your laptop connect over USB to the dongle and then over VE bus, which I'm gonna get into, to the inverter. From there, you can configure and tweak all of your settings. So having all of these devices configurable mostly and accessible over Bluetooth is really, really cool. But I really wanted to have the really cool displays that I've seen online where it actually shows you all the individual components, how they're working together, which way is current flowing, what power is going where, I wanted that. That part gets a little bit confusing, but I'm gonna to try to demystify it and straighten it up a little bit. Victron products use three different communication protocols, uh, actually four, to speak to each other. The first is the Bluetooth that I mentioned. Just those Bluetooth dongles, I can create a VE smart network, and they can all start talking and sharing information amongst themselves. However, if you want to see that information and have a really cool display and have it all configured, like here, you need a GX device. There are several different GX devices and their whole goal, their purpose is to kind of consolidate and bring all that information from all these different devices, make sense out of it, and put it in a display so you can actually see what's going on. The two that I was really looking at were the GX display, which has the display built into the unit. The trouble with that is all my gear is up front and I want the display to be right here and everything has to be connected directly to the GX device. So running all those lines up here wasn't an option. So the best bet for me was a new device they have called a Serbo GX. This is a displayless device that mounts up front, everything connects to it, and then this display connects over HDMI to the front. So we're gonna get a bit into that, but first I wanna talk about these different protocols and what was really confusing to me about Victron products. They have three different protocols to connect to this GX. They have the VE Direct, which is basically a little four pin cable, and that's gonna to go to some of your devices like your smart shunts, that's how I have it connected. It also will connect to some of the older model smart controllers. Uh, but the newer smart controllers have what's called VE CAN. Now, VE CAN is a CAN bus implementation, which is a standard, and it's a serial protocol, meaning you can line all the devices up and connect from one device to the next device to the next device, and then to the GX. And that's what I have connected for our solar controllers. The third is VE bus. It's Victron's proprietary bus connection, and it's more of a hub and spoke. So you would connect from the GX device to each MultiPlus or whatever you've got going on. The nice thing about both VE CAN and VE bus is they are standard ethernet cables. And those are pretty easy to come by. You can also make your own. I like to make my own, so the exact same length. So now that you understand a little bit better how all the devices connect to the GX device, let me take you back up front and show you that wiring. All right, a little tour of the Serbo GX and how I've got it connected to all of this stuff. You can see it's mounted right here. It gets DC power straight from the DC bus bars right here. Its connections are all coming out of the top here. So first of all, you see this little line here, that is VE direct. And it connects straight over here to the smart shunt. Also here, we have the VE CAN connection, the CAN bus implementation. And you'll see that I've got a terminator here and then this runs to here, and then from here over to here, and then another terminator. So all of these things are in series to communicate on the VE CAN system. The VE bus system is this guy right here, and the only thing connected to it is the inverter. So the Serbo GX. This is where it starts to get really cool and really fun, and this is where my tech geekness just really loves it. The GX device, as I mentioned, gets the inputs and data from all these different devices. And it 
you know, build you a picture of what that looks like, but how do you see it? Well, one way is through this device right here. I've got this connected via HDMI directly to the Servo GX. And that's really cool. I wanted to have something in here because I was used to coming here and looking at the Go Power display. So I wanted something up here. But the really cool thing about the Servo GX is you can connect to it from just about anything from just about anywhere. And here's how that works. You can connect to it directly, meaning you can connect to it over Wi-Fi. The Servo GX can spawn up its own access point, so you can connect your Wi-Fi directly to that if you don't have your own Wi-Fi. And then you can see the display, you can get into all the settings and all that good stuff. The other way you can connect to it is through what's called VRM, which is the Victron Remote Management Portal. And this has kind of two purposes. One is to give you remote access to your device. Now, how do you get the Servo GX to connect to the internet? Well, you can either have your own internet set up like we do. You know, we've got our own Wi-Fi and our own network stuff, and I'll have a link below to how we manage our internet and have our own network. But you can connect to that if you have one. If you don't have your own network, you can buy an LTE device that it will connect to the internet over LTE. So regardless of how you get there or how you connect it, the Servo GX talks to VRM, the Victron Remote Management. And it does this for two reasons. One is data logging. This thing every five minutes updates the VRM and I can change that interval if I want to. So I can go back in the VRM and I can see a historical graph of power input, power output, power from solar, battery charge. I can see all that in a graph, which is really kind of cool. If you ever want to go and see how much power did I use this week boondocking or even this week hooked up you have all that data available. Additionally, you can connect to the console. The same display I have right here, the same display I talked about that you can connect to over Wi-Fi is also available via VRM. What's cool about that is that's accessible from anywhere. I don't have to be near the RV. I could be in Timbuktu, connect to the internet. I can turn the inverter on. I can see what's going on. I can control everything. It's super cool. So now that we've got all that stuff out of the way and you kind of get a feel for how all this stuff connects let's do some demos and experiments this is the fun stuff so the first thing i want to do is just show you this interface as it is right now running on 50 amp first off you can see that over my shoulder here i have this display it's the same as this display but this is the cool stuff this is the kind of stuff i was looking for so if you look at this display here you can see in the upper left I'm connected to shore power. I'm really not pulling much right now at all. In fact, you can see that all of my AC loads are only 251 watts. The AC is not running or anything right now. Let me hit the microwave here and we'll see the load go up. You can see line one is now pulling basically almost 1700 watts and I'm pulling 1900 watts total. It's kind of nice to be able to see that, see what's on line one, see what's on line two. Let me turn that off. You can also see along the bottom here that all of my DC power is currently coming from solar. It's only 170 watts, 150 of those are going to the DC system, lights, things like that. Another little bit of that is going to the batteries. And as you can see that visually, it's super clear right there in front of you. You'll also notice that line one and line two are shown separately here. But I bring that up because my next couple of tests here where we show you inverting and power share you're going to see that line one and line two are combined and that's key for power share but first let's do a quick boondock test i'm going to go disconnect power power is disconnected you can see on the display now that ac input went completely away and my power flow changed from dc power just going straight into the batteries to now it's going into the inverter you can also see now that line one and line two are combined and they're just strictly one wattage rating so let's kick on an ac and take a look and kind of see what that looks like with a higher load we're running great we're pulling 1300 amps from the batteries now let's dig in here if i wanted to run this load right now how long could i do it i can go into my display here I can hit menu. In here, I can see each device. I can see that the MultiPlus is inverting. I got nothing on my lines in. I can see all kinds of detail in here, which is really cool. But what I wanna see is my smart shunt. So in here, I can see all my battery details, but what's important is at this current load of 1300 watts, 
which is about 102 amps from the batteries. Now granted, some of this is coming from solar, but at this load, I can run this AC for nine and a half hours. Pretty good. Of course, this number will change based on this mixture here. So you can see I'm getting some of my juice from solar, some from the batteries, and that will vary, right? So as I get more sunlight, more will come from solar. Uh, as the sun goes down, more comes from the batteries. And if the solar is generating more than I need to actually run loads, it'll go into the batteries. That's what I love about this display is it gives you a good visual representation of where stuff is going. So this is all good, just plain inverting. Let's talk about power share. This is one of the main things I was looking for in this new inverter. So let's connect to 30 amp and I'll show you some of those cool tricks. 30 amp power is hooked up. I am just waiting for the surge guard. In about five seconds, the surge guard is going to connect power. There it is. And we will see that now the inverter is getting this power, it's evaluating it, and it's gonna switch me over. You'll notice when it switches back over to shore power, it's just seamless, boom, there it is. Didn't hear any beeping or clicking or anything weird like we used to hear with the Go Power. So now I can see that we're pulling 2,700 watts from shore power. I need to go in here and tell the inverter that we have 30 amp. I'll go here to my input current limit and I will take this down to 30 amps. All right, we are now set to 30 amps. Didn't really change much on this display. I'm pulling more power from shore than I'm putting out because some of that power is now going into charging the batteries. So I'm gonna kick on the microwave, I maybe kick on another AC, and we're gonna see that this thing goes into power share mode and puts out more power than it's bringing in, taking some of that battery power and solar power and giving us a boost. There we go. So now you can see we've got 3,300-ish watts coming from shore power. 3,600 watts is 30 amps at 120 volts. I think it's you know not wanting to go right up to the 30 amps, which is smart. But you can see the extra 800-ish watts that we're pulling is being now supplied by the battery and solar. You can see those little lines that we're moving. Instead of going this way, they're now going this way. I turned the ACs back off so they weren't quite so noisy, but now you can see our numbers and stuff have shifted and this is just totally, totally cool. You may have seen some of our mooch docking videos where we connect to like 15 amp or 20 amp. You know, that is obviously very, very limiting and we had to be very careful about what we ran and when. Now that we have this inverter and line one and line two are bridged and it can do power share across the entire system, Total game changer for mooch docking, even 30 amp camping like we are now. Super excited about this new system. I really think it's awesome being able to have console access right here, right here, right here. I mean, I can get to this thing from anywhere, anytime and change the mode, set the DC power limit. I can do all kinds of stuff and I can see it all remotely. That's it, we hope you liked this video. I know we covered a lot of stuff, so if you have any questions, be sure to put them down below. I will try to answer them. I don't get to everything, but I will try.